Computer science, say level, any advice? So, um, this stuff is going to be from a student perspective because I think teachers giving advice, very useful, listen to them. Uh, but there's some stuff that I think is only really possible to explain if you've gone through the project yourself. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to start with is how you choose a project. This is probably the, one of the most difficult things um, to do the project, funny enough. Um, probably my biggest piece of advice for this is to, to keep it really, really simple. Um, sandbox it and put a lid on the complexity. There's always going to be more features that you want to add to your to your NEA project. But really, for, for the coursework project, it's better that you choose a a really strict set of objectives that you execute really well than rather than having a, a really open-ended objectives that isn't executed to um, any significant extent. Um, in my case, I actually spent a lot of time learning about how to solve driving in an urban environment, like detecting other cars or pedestrians and predicting their trajectories or looking at traffic lights and following road rules. And at some point, I just decided, all right, I'm going to limit my problem to just solving the um, static driving problem I talked about earlier. So just um, driving on a track by yourself and lane keeping, that's the problem I'm, I was really trying to solve there. And uh, yeah, that's the first piece of advice. The second is choose a project that's more common because it makes it easier for yourself um, because there's more resources available for you to learn from and get inspiration from. Uh, my project didn't really have very many good openly available and free resources out on the internet to help. So I ended up spending a lot of time frustrated figuring out things myself. It was a good learning experience, but definitely not worth the, the time for the, for the marks really. Uh, good examples of more common projects include doing a, a board game. So that's like chess or checkers. You can include an AI with um, a minimax algorithm or something like that. And the other one is, is probably the most common one actually, is to create a CRUD or create, read, update, delete application. So for this, you'd have a, a web app made in some, some framework or language, and then you'd have an API. So most likely a REST API, and then you'd use some database for the for the backend to store the data involved in that uh, in the application. That this would most likely be using uh, SQL, and then you'd, you for the for the algorithm because uh, each project needs to have some kind of algorithm. In my case, that was the um, neural network training algorithm. You'd have some st maybe st statistical analysis on the the data you have in your application or something like that. Uh, projects I wouldn't recommend. Some of you might be considering doing something like uh, you might be into game development and you might wait, you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to do some 3D game uh, in Unity. In, in all honesty, I wouldn't recommend doing this because uh, it's easy to fall into a trap of spending loads of time making the art and designing the levels and making everything uh, look good in the game. But that stuff isn't concretely what's going to get you marks. So I think uh, you might end up spending more time for less marks if you choose to do a game. Uh, and also anything deep into machine learning like mine, uh, really enough, I wouldn't recommend because I think it's better off. It's better that you pick a a more straightforward project. You can incorporate machine learning if you'd like, but don't base the whole thing off of machine learning. I think uh, that's probably the best way of going about it if you're if you're interested in that. Um, also, hardware based projects are they're uncommon, but they are just as viable as software ones. Um, problems to anticipate with hardware projects is that um, there might be issues with the electronics that you use, like uh, if you're using sensors or motors for a, for a robot in your project um, you might have uh, issues with those and calibration problems the school has access to arduinos and raspberry pis and any other stuff you might have in electronics so that's a another option if you if you choose to do that okay second set of advice is to do with your with your documentation so documentation is is how the exam board is going to you know is going to mark your work so don't don't underestimate your documentation. Even if your code is you know, mind-blowing, if your system and the surrounding context with it um, are not presented well in your documentation, it won't look uh, as easy. To, first, it's not, it's not as easy to understand for them, and it's also not as impressive because they don't know why you did certain things. Uh, I'd say start your docs early. You don't really want to be rushing them days before the deadline. We're, we're told that every single year, but somehow it still ends up happening. Uh, also, one of the biggest mistakes I did was not um, pacing out and documenting as I went. Uh, don't do it all after you finished your code. Uh, so, yeah. So you should be working on your code and your documentation in in parallel. Uh, as far as the the order you do your documentation in, I'd say don't go in sequential order of each section. The mark scheme actually says 
explicitly that you don't have to do the, the five different sections um, in that sequential order. Um, I'd say this 10 step ordering fits uh, most people's workflows quite well. You might be different. Uh, do your analysis first. Uh, make sure you don't make it too long. Remember, it's only nine marks and the other sections are um, more than the implementation and design. Um, unless you already have a concrete plan of what you want to do, which you most likely don't, make a very brief and rough design. And that's, that's because there's loads of aspects of your project and problems um, that you that comes with actually creating a system that you can't anticipate until you actually start touching code. So, you know, um, cases where you've had you had to rewrite your entire design because you realize you can't actually do something. So expect to rewrite your design at some point entirely. Uh, while you're doing your analysis and design sections, you should um, do some research to, to get a clearer idea of what methods, tools, languages, libraries you might end up using in your actual code. Get them installed on your computer, uh, try them out, make sure that they actually work. Um, this could be things like IDEs, compilers or interpreters or libraries. So in my case, that was um, Keras and TensorFlow uh, or you know installing a local database server if you're, if you're making a making a web app. And then after you finish all your research and uh, an analysis and a rough design, go and do your implementation and write your implementation documentation as you as you go. Uh, I have a, the next section is on implementation tips. Then after you've finished your code implementation section, I'd say come back to your design and mold it around your actual implementation. So even though the, in, the, in the final docs, it's meant to look like you've you've planned things out in your design section and then executed them well in your implementation. I'd say the best way of going about it is to do your implementation, see what is possible for you to do, and then make it look like your design was what you planned to do in the first place, if that makes sense. Um, then after you finish your, at that point, you should have finished analysis, design, and implementation. Then finish your testing section. One point about testing is that um, AQA wants you to do relatively primitive testing they're not expecting like unit tests of all of your functions and stuff just a uh, very very sort of like concrete simple and like almost obvious in some cases testing that you want to do uh, also recording a video for testing is a good idea um even though examples don't necessarily have to look at it it's uh, it's a good thing to send alongside it uh, after you finish your testing finish your evaluation section this is where you'd put things like uh, oh i wish i had done this thing that i didn't have time to do or uh, or whatever that was. And then um, things to put at the end of your documentation. Uh, firstly, any uh, references or links that you might have. So this could be for uh, things you did in research or things that like bits of code that you took from uh, GitHub or whatever it might be. Keep a, a reference or bibliography section uh, of some sort for all of the links that you've, you've got in your documentation. Uh, and then also all of your code should be pasted in. Uh, the, the teachers will go through this, but... Um, you you want to have all your code in an, uh, an, an, an in an in an appendix section indexed by file. Um, it's not necessarily required, but um, our department teachers advised that. Then once once you feel like you've you've mostly finished it, uh, give the whole document a, pr pr a proofread. Throw it throw like each section into Grammarly for spag errors. There's going to be loads because it's a relatively long document, and then uh, and then you hand it in. Yeah, so I think that's the that's the best ordering to do your to do your documentation in. Um, going more in, more deeply into step four, implementation. This is advice on how to actually do your make make your project in, in code. Firstly, if you have no idea where to start, I'd say look at existing code on GitHub or tutorials uh, on the internet. YouTube is a good place, but only use them for inspiration. Don't copy it outright. And if you do use something from a from a tutorial or existing code base, maybe use an individual function from it and then reference it in your, in your documentation. Uh, if you're already comfortable with the um, with the tools that you that you plan to use for your project, then go ahead and use those. That's great. But if the um, if the best fit for purpose tools for the project you've chosen uh, are unfamiliar to you, go and learn them. You still have loads of time to do that. Uh, like. I used a tutorial series for the um, Flask framework on YouTube because I hadn't used that before for my web app. Uh, yep. Yeah, so you also want to make it as easy as possible for examples to look through your code as well as your documentation. So follow good practices for programming. So this is the main ones really using a good, well laid out file structure for your project. 
using functions you don't want your your thing to all be like a long string of spaghetti code use use functions where you can and then also use use classes this is also pretty much required in the mark scheme at some point so make sure you have some of these involved also comment your code properly but don't state the don't state the obvious uh, and then this is to inform your testing section. Make sure as you go, you incorporate validation. So for example, if you have a, a, a form uh, where you have someone enter a, a date or their name or something that you have, you have testing to make sure it's, it's validated in the, in the right format. Cause this will make your testing section a lot easier. Now the next bit, this is, this is a big um, point of contention for me when I was going through it, which was, which was libraries. So my suggestion would be to use libraries where it's justifiable that you can use it don't be overly reliant on libraries but also don't shy away from using them my, my logic would be to try to do as much with you know common library codes the, the standard language code but then when you get to a point where something is obviously too strenuous to write something from scratch um try look for a library or framework to help you with that so uh, an example for that in my case would be my uh, my neural network the architecture of my neural network, you know, 25 million, uh, 26 million weights, that architecture was way too complex to build efficiently from scratch. So I end up using Keras for that instead. Um, exam boards will still appreciate good usage of libraries where justifiably required. Sometimes you might have to uh, reinvent the wheel for marks, especially with uh, algorithms. Like a good example is in, in, uh, in a board game. Uh, if you're making a board game, you you might have to use the um, minimax algorithm. There are libraries that will do minimax for you efficiently, but um, to get the marks for the algorithm in your code, you might need to write it from scratch. Um, anyway, so that's what I mean by reinventing the wheel. And if you're um, if you're iffy over whether or not you should use a library for a particular feature or objective, uh, ask a teacher in uh, circumstantially, and they'll 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 try and give you a better idea over that. And the last thing I have is for user interface. Uh, it does not have to look good. My, you saw my driver application, that thing looked horrible. Um, I used Bootstrap to style my um, web app trainer, so I didn't have to deal with the, the CSS for that. The, probably the best way of going about it is to make your user interface functional, not good looking. So yeah, that just about sums up all the advice I have, project choice, documentation, and implementation. Um, hopefully that was at least somewhat helpful. If you have if you have any questions related to my NEA or just um, like doing the NEA in general, drop them in the chat now. Uh, I've also made two documents that will be sent into your Teams channels for computer science, that's year 12s, uh, which is the advice that I've just covered, written up comprehensively and a concise version of the NEA mark scheme that I made before I'd started writing my documentation. So you'll see those at some point today probably. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Will you be marked down if you don't show a video of your tests? No, uh, that's optional. Uh, yeah, but I, I suggest making one because uh, th then you can show the exam board that your that your system actually works. So, I mean, the next best alternative is probably putting screenshots in your documentation. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd suggest making a video anyways, but it's not required by any means. Is it okay to be approaching something new concepts in your NEA? And is it possible to make this a learning experience? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So when I started my NEA, I had no idea what machine learning was. I didn't know what a neural network was. I didn't know what backpropagation was. I spent time learning all of those myself and then using it. So yeah, it's a learning experience, but doing doing something that you have absolutely no idea about is, is obviously going to be harder. It's going to warrant more time and effort than if you're doing something that you already kind of know how to do but um yeah it's, uh it, that's perfectly fine for a web application with a database like an online store where would you recommend implementing mathematical models okay um so that's essentially a CRUD application you have you have data in the database and this could like in, in that example an online store you could have you know prices number of sales of each item or something and the best mathematical model to have is to in that case would be maybe for example, to predict sales of some of your items or have a ranking system for your best selling items or somehow use regression models to try and predict what the best selling item for the next month would be. So that 
not like hugely complicated statistical models where you're trying to do like super weird curve fitting and try and try to figure out um that kind of stuff but uh yeah just a relatively straightforward statistical analysis that is relevant to the to the context of that so yeah that's what that's what i suggest for a mathematical model in that case